Hello, and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Here's what we're looking at. A WTTW News exclusive public records show one of the leading candidates for mayor, Paul Vallis's legal primary residence, is not in the city of Chicago. What that means for his campaign. Low property tax collection rates in the south suburbs and how it impacts communities. We'll talk about the recent report from the Cook County Treasurer's Office. And a small Chicago museum gets a very big grant from the city. What Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, plans to do with it. And now to our top story tonight, a WTTW News exclusive. Former CPS Schools Chief Paul Vallis is polling as one of the front runners in the race to become mayor of Chicago. But WTTW News can confirm that Vallis's legal primary residence is not actually in the city. And we've learned that our inquiries have prompted the Cook County Assessor's Office to open an investigation. Questions about Vallis's residency paint a complicated picture of rules establishing who is and isn't qualified to run for mayor. Crime is out of control. Paul Vallis has vaulted to front-runner status in a campaign largely focused on fixing Chicago's crime problem. First of all, you have to provide public safety throughout the city, but obviously you have to provide public safety downtown. But an analysis of public records showed that Vallis's legal permanent residence is not in the city that he desires to lead. Cook County property records show Vallis and his wife Sharon have owned this single family home in south suburban Palos Heights through a trust since at least 2007. Records show the Vallises have received homestead exemptions on the property since at least 2017, which means by law it is their primary residence. But according to official campaign records filed with the State Board of Elections, Vallis lists a second floor Bridgeport apartment as his Chicago residence. It's also where Vallis is currently registered to vote. State and municipal laws are murky when it comes to who is officially a resident and eligible to run. Former City Inspector General Joe Ferguson has investigated residency cases and says a simple standard has to be met. Where's the pillow that they lay their head on every single night and wake up from every single morning? If they've been doing that for a substantial period of time, usually we talk about it in terms of a year, um, they have established residence under the law as the Illinois Supreme Court has set out. But where exactly has Vallis physically resided over the last year? An analysis of further public records paints a complicated picture. Documents filed with the State Board of Elections show a September donation from Paul Vallis to Alexei Janulius's campaign for state treasurer, listed under Vallis's Palos Heights address. In paperwork filed with the Secretary of State's office last year, Vallis lists himself as an officer of his educational consulting company, the Vallis Group, using both his Palos Heights and Chicago addresses. In a written response to questions sent by WTTW, the Vallis campaign says Vallis, quote, resides in Chicago and visits the Palis location when his schedule permits. The couple has made this sacrifice so that their elderly parents can be cared for in their residences. Sharon Vallis is the caretaker for Paul's 93-year-old mother, as well as her elderly parents who live nearby and are also facing health problems. Former Mayor Rahm Emanuel is no stranger to residency questions. His 2010 campaign for mayor survived a legal challenge after he had just moved back from D.C. The state Supreme Court ruled in Emanuel's favor because he kept personal belongings in a home he owned here while he was away. Bed. Kids piano that they do their piano classes on. Um, two TVs. This is also not the first time Vallis has faced residency questions. When he filed to run for mayor in 2019, Vallis listed an apartment in Lincoln Park as his address. An analysis of property records shows that residence belongs to Vallis's business partner, Vallis Group co-founder Tressa Pankovitz. Pankovitz has claimed homestead exemptions on that property every year since at least 2017, establishing it as her primary legal residence. The period for candidates to file legal challenges to opponents' campaigns has passed, which means the Chicago Board of Elections can't weigh in on Vallis's residence. Ferguson says the board would have likely ruled in Vallis's favor. Where does he sleep? Where does he vote? Where does he get up every morning? Where does he go back to every night to watch movies? It, it boils down to that. And if that is a place in Chicago for an extended period of time, then he's a resident. An opposing campaign did file a residency challenge to Willie Wilson, who owns a home in south suburban Hazelcrest. But Wilson maintains an apartment on Wacker Drive, and the case was eventually dropped. 
The Vallis campaign did not make the candidate available for an interview, but responded to written questions, and you can read all of those on our website, wttw.com slash news. And as a result of our inquiries, the Cook County Assessor's Office has opened an investigation into whether or not the Vallises have improperly claimed a homestead exemption on their Palos Heights property. Heather Sharon has much more about that. Now to some of our other top stories. A culinary arts student who was shot and seriously wounded during an armed robbery in Lincoln Park last May is suing the city of Chicago and Mayor Lori Lightfoot. The 24-year-old's attorneys claim officials created the danger that led to the shooting that left Dakota early in a wheelchair. We submit if the police had continued their pursuit of Mr. Brownlee and his stolen BMW, it would have prevented this entire chain of events and the disaster that happened to Dakota within just an hour later. All they had to do was to continue to tail Mr. Brownlee and make an effort to stop him. But they didn't. Early's attorneys allege that when Chicago police officers learned of Tyshawn Brownlee's whereabouts and began following him just an hour before he allegedly shot Early, they were forced to back off and end their pursuit to comply with city policies. You can read that full story on our website. State gambling regulators gave the initial green light to Chicago's proposed temporary casino landlord. The Illinois Gaming Board unanimously approved initial supplier licenses to Friedman Properties, owner of the historic Medina Temple in River North. The building was picked to serve as Bally's temporary casino for at least two years while the permanent structure is built. Mayor Lightfoot has plans for it to open and start generating revenue by June. City officials say they're expanding Chicago's mental health network to all 77 Chicago communities. We have sites that are offering clinical mental health care that is no barrier, no requirement for insurance, no requirement or asking about immigration status, no need to be able to pay, and able to call a single number or go to a single website to find this care. We're in communities. The expansion includes funding for 177 clinics citywide, along with primary and behavioral health care at 80 shelters for people experiencing homelessness. Earlier today, the Southside Iris St. Patrick's Day Parade announced the chaplains of the Chicago Fire and Police Departments as their marshals. The Southside Parade will be held for the 45th year on Sunday, March 12th in Chicago's Beverly Morgan Park neighborhood. Organizers say it's the largest community-based parade outside of Dublin, Ireland. That should be a big one to see. It always is. <laughs> I'm sure. Coming up in the program, a $5 million grant for a small museum. But first, how low property tax collection rates are affecting basic services in the south suburbs. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Low property tax collection rates in the south suburbs are having devastating effects on services offered to communities. New research from the Cook County Treasurer's Office shows tax collection rates as low as 29% for Ford Heights. In Robbins, the rate jumps to 49%, and in Harvey and Phoenix, each right around a 52% tax collection rate. This all compares to the county's overall of 96%. The Treasurer's Office says that high overall number masks the mostly black and lower income communities struggling to collect taxes. Joining us to talk about this are Hal Dardick, Director of Research for the Cook County Treasurer's Office, and Christopher J. Clark, the Mayor of Harvey, which is located in the south suburbs of Chicago. Gentlemen, thanks to you both for coming to join us tonight. Uh, Mayor Clark, let's start with you, please. A 52% tax collection rate means that you're missing out on $27 million in property taxes uh, that aren't being collected. What's the impact on your community of not having that revenue? I think your intro is absolutely perfect. It's devastating. Um, we, can't, we have difficulty providing just the basic services for people who deserve it in our city. And when I'm talking about police and fire protection, streets, lights, curbs, sidewalks, the normal maintenance that probably everyday people would, would think that are supposed to happen with the city, we always have difficulty trying to um, 
come up with the funds to be able to do so. In addition to that, it's also attracting talent to be able to do some of the things that we need to do in our city to provide a, a better quality of life for our residents. So the impact is not just devastating, it is beyond devastating. And, and Mayor, give us a sense, why aren't these taxes being collected? Why aren't they being paid? Well, we've had a, a bit of an exodus from our city over the past 30 years, and, uh, and because of that, I believe that many of the people walked away from the homes. Um, some of them due to, of course, housing crisis, property tax crisis, the, 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 the tax rate being as high as it was in the city of Harvey for quite some time, because I think now Harvey is maybe third in the highest tax uh, rate, but at one time we held that spot of number one, and it makes people walk away from their properties because they can no longer afford them. But as a result, we see, especially when it comes to the residents, many deserving people who have worked for their homes uh, and tried to support their families for years lose their homes and try to find somewhere else to go. And that is not, in my opinion, the American dream. Hal, you are part of the, of course, the research team that did this analysis. Give us a broader sense of the impact here. Yeah, it, it's not just Harvey, of course, and you mentioned the four suburbs that are at 52% or below, but there are a number of other South suburbs. If you take the top lowest collection rates throughout the county, uh, 13 of 14 of them are in the South suburbs. So it's an area that's been uh, devastated. A lot of it uh, is due to the high level of vacancy in that area, and for example, in, uh, in Harvey, uh, the uh, vacancy is about 17% of the property is just not being used, and the collection rate on that is about 27%. So that's really dragging it down. The other thing that we can't know uh, from the study, uh, unless we visited every house, is how many people have abandoned homes there, and they are destined to be vacant at some point. Your research also touches on something the mayor just referenced is uh, the, the tax levies themselves, uh, Harvey having the third highest. Give us a sense of how municipalities have tried to, to use what they can tax uh, to make up for what they're not getting. Yeah, I think there's an impetus if they're not collecting everything that they can to try and increase the levy so that they can capture a little bit more. So it creates this sort of vicious cycle, and then once the rates increase, uh, less people are able to pay. Uh, the tax rates in the south suburbs are some of the very highest in the, in the nation. You can end up paying uh, basically in taxes in 12 to 15 years what the principal cost of your home was in the first place. So over the 30-year life of a mortgage, you've effectively paid for that house three times. And I can bear witness to that. As obviously a <laughs> resident of your city. For, definitely <laughs> for sure, because the value of my home, based on what I was paying in taxes, in, in less than 10 years, I could have paid for the home uh, itself, would have exceeded the principal. And, it's, I, and I'm not the only one. So when we're dealing with this particular issue, it, my thing is we have to try to find a better way to deal with the tax collection. And I'm appreciative that uh, Pappas' office, office has come up with this report to bring it to light. Because if you just look at 96%, you're saying to yourself, everything's good. And it's not, especially in black and brown communities. Uh, Mayor, what recourse do you have? It actually seems like we don't have a lot of recourse, recourse because the cities aren't really a part of the tax collection process. That's a Cook County thing. So one of the things I'd like to see happen is, is a way for the municipalities to be more active uh, and have more authority as far as that collection is concerned. Um, in the city of Harvey, we've tried to, the city itself has tried to maintain its levy as, as, as flat as we possibly could. But we also have other taxing bodies that are a part of our overall tax in the county that continue to raise their taxes while we continue to, to try to hold ours flat. Um, so there's so many different ways that we can approach it, probably beyond what we have to discuss today. Um, and hopefully, I'm hoping that all of the parties will come together so we can figure this thing out. Hal, we've talked about a few things. What do you think of some of the root causes here? Well, one of them is just the inequities that are inherent in primarily funding a school system through the property tax because there are communities with less wealth. They're going to be able, not be able to, to collect as much, and they're going to have to in keep increasing those rates to try to get to a, a place where they, they can afford it. 
so I think uh, some more progressive way of funding education in the state of Illinois would go a huge way. The other thing is finding better ways to take these properties that are uh, deteriorating in disuse and put them back to productive use. We did a study last year on sort of the failure of the scavenger cell, it's a last ditch effort to place these homes and we're, we're trying to develop uh, in-house a new system that would be much more efficient so that the properties didn't get to this point where perhaps uh, no one wants them anymore. Mayor, you said you don't have a lot of recourse. Uh, who does? What would you like to see the county or the state do? I'd like to see the county and the state pass some type of legislation that affords, for instance, uh, municipalities that have a collection rate as, lower, as low as we do um, to afford us a little bit more authority in how we go about trying to ascertain those properties and putting those back on the tax rolls. Sometimes it can take up to, up to two two and a half to three years before the city can even acquire the property. Well, at that particular point in time, the true scavengers that have gutted the home, the animals that have torn up the home, and the weather that has totally dilapidated the home now makes it of no value at all. And now the investors or even single families don't want the property because it's not worth it anymore. So we need to find a better way to go about handling that. Okay, big problem. Uh, Mayor Clark, Hal Dardick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Up next, a local pastor shares his story of finding light in dark times. But first, a look at the weather. Spiritual lessons for thriving in turbulent times. That's the focus of Reverend Otis Moss III's new book, Dancing in the Darkness. Angel Ito recently sat down with him. Here's a sneak peek of their conversation airing Saturday on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. In the book, you say that this title was inspired by your children. Can you yes. tell us a little bit more about where that comes from? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. So the, the title, Dancing in the Darkness, really comes from my daughter. Mm -hmm. It was in 2008, and at our church, we had a gentleman by the name of Senator Barack Obama who was running for president. And as a result of that, uh, there were some attacks on the congregation and my predecessor, Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr. Mm -hmm. And a matter of fact, I remember I was working out at Bally's, I think it's owned by LA Fitness now, and I was warming down and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, is that your church up there? And I look up on the screen and there is a conservative commentator just going off mm -hmm. about the church. And so I said, it's time for me to, to leave at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that started what was known as a, we call it the media gauntlet, mm -hmm. 40 outlets. Wow. Every single Sunday showed up to Trinity trying to get a quote. And then wow. we had death threats. Uh, myself, Dr. Wright, the church, bomb sniffing dogs, every single Sunday to make sure it was safe. And so I had to get security. We had security at the church. Uh, my predecessor had to get security, Dr. Wright. And one evening, uh, we heard something in the house. And my wife tapped me and said, you need to check that out. So I grabbed my rod and my staff, that comforts me, uh, being a Louisville slugger, uh, and looked around the house. And I heard the noise again coming from my daughter's bedroom. And I'm thinking, did someone, you know, break into our home? Was I going to have to defend uh, my children and my wife? And I come into my daughter's room, and there she is in the middle of the room, and she's dancing. And she's saying, look, Daddy, I'm dancing. It's 3 a.m., so I get that fatherly voice, baby, you need to go to bed. But then the spirit just rested on me and said, mm -hmm. look at your daughter. Mm -hmm. She's dancing in the darkness. Mm -hmm. The darkness is around her, mm -hmm. but it's not in her. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I ran down to my study and I just started writing until the sun came up. Mm -hmm. And when I finished, 
I stepped into the pulpit and said, we are called to dance in this darkness, mm -hmm. dance with love, with joy, with justice, with compassion, with dignity. Mm -hmm. And if we dance long enough, as scripture says, mm -hmm. joy does come in the morning. So you talk about linking love and justice yes. very early in the book. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, well, it's very interesting that uh, in this civic moment that we don't link these two together, mm -hmm. that love without justice is simply sentimentality. Mm -hmm. Justice without love becomes legalism and, and brutality. But when they're linked together, and I like to say when they walk down the aisle, mm -hmm. they have two children, one child named Transformation and the other child named Liberation. Mm -hmm. And when that is central in our civic conversations and our personal conversations, it leads to transformation. Mm -hmm. Again, that was Reverend Otis Moss III, senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ. And check out Angel Ito's full conversation with him on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, this Saturday at 6.30. Back with more right after this. Where have we been? Where are we at? Where are we going? Essentially to be able to help anyone and everyone in the community, whether that's through academic support, social emotional learning, or just providing a safe space for youth to be able to be there. This is the fabric of the neighborhood. You need to take care of the neighborhood. It's an ecosystem. The city of Chicago is awarding a $5 million community development grant to a small museum in Chicago. It's part of the city's Chicago Recovery Plan, which uses federal and local funds to support organizations and neighborhoods hurt by the pandemic. Producer Mark Vitale recently visited Intuit at their home in Westtown to get a sense of what this windfall means to them. Here's another look. Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, has been on Milwaukee Avenue near Chicago and Ogden since 1999. They showcase artwork by self-taught artists who didn't follow a traditional path to art making. Their newest exhibition presents drawings by Tariq Eccles, a resident at Little City in Palatine, a community of children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Into its $5 million grant stands to be a game changer for the 32-year-old nonprofit. This is exactly transformative. We're a small institution, and this is going to allow us to take what I consider a Chicago gem and transform it into a real cultural jewel of the city. I think a lot of people don't realize um, that Intuit is here. We're one of the few museums in the world that focus specifically on this genre of art, art made by people outside the mainstream art world. And one of the reasons that Intuit is here in Chicago is because in Chicago, that art was embraced early on before it became popular across the country. So Chicagoans interested in the edgy and different and quirky were really thinking about this art. The city was looking for projects that were ready to go from groups that were able to provide a 25% match. And candidates didn't have to be nonprofits or cultural organizations. The museum says it will expand to the second floor of the building, which is currently used for storage. These renderings from their proposal depict new spaces and teaching areas. They also plan to enlarge the permanent exhibit on Henry Darger, the celebrated visionary artist from Chicago. And they'll have a new look facing the street. One of the challenges here is that uh, our facade is not particularly welcoming. It's not conducive to making this an inviting place. So we'll be opening up that facade, making it more like what it probably was originally, glass storefront on the first floor, making it very welcoming with an accessible ramp. All of which ties into the larger goal of the grant, developing the community by helping an anchor in the community. Here we are, a small museum in the Westtown neighborhood, and this is our opportunity to really take this great building that was never intended to be an art museum and transform it into a 21st century museum for the city of Chicago and beyond. We're one of the first places to really showcase this artwork, and we're going to have an even better space in which to do that showcasing. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The other big grant winner is not a cultural organization. The Pullman Hotel Group also received a $5 million community development grant to build a new hotel on the far south side. There's more from our interview at Intuit on our website. And while you're there, check out our list of 23 recommended Chicago arts and culture events for 2023. 
Before we go, a correction to a story we reported earlier tonight on Paul Vallis's residency. I mistakenly said Vallis had sent a check to the Janulius campaign for state treasurer. Indeed, it was the Janulius campaign for Secretary of State. I regret that error. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And then at 10, right here for Chicago Tonight. We break down a newly proposed and lucrative contract for ComEd that would extend the utility giant's deal with the city for 15 years. And it's auto show time. WTTW News explains why you can't buy a car in Illinois on Sundays. Been wanting to know that. <laughs> we leave you tonight with beautiful music and a beautiful message from songwriter Burt Bacharach, who died today at 94. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Is love, sweet love, it's the only thing that there's just too little of what the world needs now is love sweet love no not just for some but everyone Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages. What the world needs now. What do you want, Nelson? One guess. The victim is Susie Colbrook. I'm afraid she's been murdered. Give me what you got. All right, then. So, you have a bullet wound to the heart. More holes in this coroner's report than Swiss cheese. Murder cover-up at Briar Lane? Someone wanted this woman dead. We need to find out why. The PBS NewsHour has a rich legacy of in-depth reporting and strong storytelling. Only four people have sat in that chair before us, and the enormity of this moment is not lost on me. People turn to us because they know they can hear from trusted sources of information and news. That won't change a bit, even as the faces behind the desk change. Good evening. I'm Jeff Bennett. And I'm Amna Nawaz.